There's been a lot of talk about Europa lately. I'm part of that equation. And for good reason, too. You know, it has a lot of things going for it as a potential spot for life to form. And if you happen to watch my recent video on the Europa Clipper mission, you might remember me saying this. Now, by this point, some of you might be wondering, why Europa? Like, why not Saturn's moon Enceladus, which we believe may be similar to Europa? And while there are good reasons for this, some of which I go over in that video, it did get me thinking. What about the other ocean worlds in our solar system? What can we, or have we already learned about them? And this brings us back to Saturn's moon Enceladus, which is what I would like to talk about today. In 1785, British astronomer William Herschel approached King George about a project to build a telescope unlike any that had come before it. Without royal patronage, a project of this scale would just not be possible. He received 4,000 pounds for this project, and while it did go over budget, the massive 40-foot telescope was completed. With this telescope, on August 29th, 1789, Herschel discovered a tiny bright dot orbiting Saturn. It was named by his son, John Herschel II, and his 1847 publication results of astronomical observation made at the Cape of Good Hope. Here he suggested names for the first seven moons that were discovered around Saturn. These were Mimas, Enceladus, Tethys, Dione, Rhea, Titan, and Lapetus. These names come from the Titans who were the children of Kronos, Saturn, in Greek mythology. And so, Enceladus had been both officially discovered and named. Yet, this was just the beginning of our exploration of this majestic, icy moon. Europa is thought to be like Enceladus in that it is an ocean world found beneath a thick icy crust. At points, the trapped water finds a way to escape through this outer shell, escaping into space as large plumes. There's one key difference, though. For Europa, we suspect it's ejecting plumes of water vapor, but we won't likely be able to confirm this until the Clipper mission arrives. Enceladus, on the other hand, thanks to the Cassini mission, is kind of a different story. Here, we have confirmed that Enceladus is indeed ejecting these plumes of water vapor out into space. Cassini had even flown through and taken samples of these plumes during its time in the Saturnian system. With the ability to study this, scientists have determined that Enceladus possesses most or maybe even all of the chemical ingredients needed for life. What are these ingredients, you might ask? Well, along with water and a source of energy, like the sun, for us, in hand with this, we have the chemical building blocks themselves. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. This is what is needed for life as we know it to form. One of these, hydrogen, means that Enceladus also has geothermal vents releasing heat and chemical energy into the oceans that could be useful for potential microbes. Enceladus is about as wide as Arizona, and within our solar system, it has the highest albedo, which means its surface is more reflective than anything else in our solar system. The plumes it ejects that I mentioned earlier create a ring around Saturn as Enceladus orbits. Though most of the ejecta falls back down onto Enceladus, which increases its reflectiveness, so only a small amount of the ejected material actually makes it into the ring. Its icy surface is smooth in some places and has craters in others. 
Some of these craters reach up to 22 miles or 35 kilometers in diameter. Due to how reflective it is, its surface is bright white all over, with so much reflected light that its surface is rather cold, right? Because all that heat energy is getting reflected and radiated right back out into space. Its surface comes in around negative 330 degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 201 degrees Celsius. The orbit of Enceladus falls between Mimas and Tethys, two of its other companion moons, and it is around 148,000 miles away from Saturn. It completes one orbit every 32.9 hours. Like our moon, Enceladus is tidally locked to its host planet, in its case Saturn, and I actually have made a video about tidal locking. You can check it out right here, if you would like. And Enceladus is also part of an orbital resonance. This is when two or more moons line up with their parent planet at regular intervals, and they interact gravitationally when this happens. Europa is also in an orbital resonance, for example. Every time Enceladus makes two orbits, one of its larger counterpart moons, Dione, makes one orbit. Dione's gravity places Enceladus into an elliptical shape orbit, making its distance from Saturn change depending on where it is in its orbit. All of this causes tidal heating on the moon, which is what we expect its thermal energy comes from. So with Enceladus being a similar situation to Europa, potentially, you know, in the same vein, do we have any planned missions to explore it further? And as it turns out, yes, we do. Or at least we might, anyway. The main one I would like to touch on today is NASA's proposed Enceladus Orbilander. Orbilander. Gotta hand it to them with the clever name on that one. The idea behind this mission is that it would start with an orbiting phase where it would spend a year and a half around Enceladus, sampling its water plumes as they extended its space and conducting other science. Then, it would land on the surface of Enceladus for a two-year mission to study materials for evidence of life. If this mission is selected, it has an estimated cost of 4.9 billion doll hairs. Wait, what? D doll hairs? What is this guy writing? Shouldn't, shouldn't that be dollars? If selected, the mission will have an estimated budget of $4.9 billion. Now, hold on just a second. How do I mess with this guy? Oh, you know what? I got it. Hold on. An estimated budget of 4.9 billion doll hairs. Silly, but there's no way he's going to fall for that. With a chance of launching in the late 2030s on an SLS or a Falcon Heavy, factoring in the travel time with this timeline, it would land sometime in the early 2050s. The spacecraft would be unique in that instead of comprising of an orbiter and a lander, the single spacecraft is envisioned to be a combination of both. Part of what makes this possible is Enceladus's small size. The amount of energy needed to land is negligible compared to what is required to get into its orbit to begin with. So basically, once it's in orbit, it won't take much energy for the spacecraft to also be able to land. There is more cool stuff with this mission, such as its instruments, that, you know, are, are really neat. So. You could always look it up yourself if you're curious, or perhaps sometime in the future, it just might get a video of its own. 
the European Space Agency, or ESA, is getting in on the action as well. This would be part of their Voyage 2050 program, which encompasses missions that would span the time frame of 2035 to 2050. So, similar to what NASA was looking at. Here, we can see the current mission concept. As you can see, it also includes both orbiting and landing on Enceladus. I could not find a name for this mission yet, but if it has one and you know, please let us know in the comments. Regardless of the order that they launch and arrive, I'm excited to see every stage of these two missions unfold. I often say that Europa is my favorite moon, aside perhaps our own, but Enceladus is a close second or third. And while it won't be for a while, I am happy to see plans are in place to visit it as well. One of the things I learned while making this video is that we might get to land on it too. Like I just had no idea that, you know, that it would be that feasible to do in the same mission. In the same way, I am interested to see what Europa can teach us. I'm also interested to see what Enceladus can teach us both in terms of what it takes for us to reach the moons and also what we might discover there. For now, we can always look at the magnificent photos of Enceladus we do have and look forward to the future when we get to study it further. I hope you've learned something today and let's all step outside tonight and look towards the stars.